Bueno, les dejo con Luis. Muchas gracias. Bueno, en primer lugar, quería agradeceros a todos vuestra presencia, eh, por supuesto, a Centro Sefarad Israel y a la comunidad eh, judía de Madrid por haber eh, hecho toda la labor de traer aquí a, a Noa para que nos dé testimonio. Él lleva toda esta semana aquí en, en España, acaba de estar en, en la exposición y, de alguna manera, la idea con el programa cultural de la muestra que inauguramos hoy es que la estancia de la exposición en Madrid no se limite a las tres horas que, que puede durar la visita, sino que, de alguna manera, deje un pozo de reflexión, de educación y de memoria eh, en la ciudad y en nuestro país. Eh, para nosotros es, es, era muy importante poder comenzar con un testimonio, con un testimonio real, en este caso de, de Noah Krieger, y solo puedo, de alguna manera, agradecer de todo corazón a todas las personas que han hecho posible tanto la exposición como el programa cultural que, que inauguramos hoy. Y con esto doy la palabra a Miguel de Lucas, que es el director del, del Centro eh, Sefarat Israel, a los que, como hemos dicho, pues, estamos muy agradecidos por toda esta labor que están haciendo. Muchas gracias, Luis. Eh, yo también quiero agradecerte el que nos acojas hoy aquí. Yo creo que este es un escenario inmejorable para para el testimonio de Nueva Cleaver y realmente estamos muy, muy contentos de contar con vuestra colaboración. Yo me dirijo a ustedes en mi calidad de director general del Centro Sefarad Israel, pero también en otra, tal vez menos conocida, que es que soy el jefe de la delegación de España ante la Alianza Internacional para la Memoria y el Holocausto. Esto es un organismo internacional del que, está, del que España es miembro y forman parte muchos, la mayoría de los estados de nuestro entorno, que se dedica básicamente a ese fin, que es conservar la memoria del holocausto, que no se olvide lo que ocurrió. Y en este organismo, cada X tiempo, aproximadamente cada seis años, se hace una evaluación de los países para ver cómo se han portado a este respecto, qué han hecho realmente en su compromiso por la memoria de la Shoah, del holocausto. Y tengo que decirles una cosa, que España ha sido evaluada recientemente en el año 2017 y que ha sido excelentemente calificada. De hecho, el plenario de esta organización dijo que España es el país que más ha avanzado en los últimos diez años en la memoria del holocausto. Es algo de lo que creo que podemos estar todos orgullosos, porque además es un trabajo de instituciones públicas españolas, como lo es el Centro Separa Israel, pero también de instituciones comunitarias judías, como la Federación de Comunidades Judías de España, como la Comunidad Judía de Madrid u otras comunidades también, y también el esfuerzo de muchas personas, de muchas iniciativas, y en concreto este esfuerzo de Musealia y del canal también es algo maravilloso y que nosotros hemos reflejado en nuestro informe. Con lo cual, podemos sentirnos algo orgullosos, aunque digamos que esto no es para satisfacernos. Tenemos que hacer todavía muchísimas cosas más. Porque, en parte, tenemos un resultado tan excelente porque partíamos casi de cero. O sea, en España había muy poca memoria del holocausto. Esa sería mi primera reflexión. La segunda, quiero decirles que eh, llevamos, ya son casi seis años, que llevamos con la Comunidad Judía de Madrid dedicando dos semanas del mes de enero de una manera intensiva a lo que es la memoria del holocausto, con distintos actos en toda España, pero sobre todo muy centrados en la Comunidad de Madrid, en municipios de la, del propio municipio de Madrid, pero también en municipios como Alcobendas, Alcorcón, Majadahonda, Las Rozas, eh, eh, Móstoles, eh, San Agustín de Guadalix, en todos ellos, y en alguno que, que me dejo en el tintero, sencillamente, hacemos actos de memoria. También tenemos el acto en la Asamblea de Madrid, que es el acto pionero en España en memoria del holocausto, y también el acto, de memoria, el acto de Estado de memoria del holocausto en el Senado, importantísimo, con la presencia de varios ministros, y que es el acto central de memoria del holocausto en España. Es un gran trabajo, es un gran esfuerzo, pero realmente vale la pena. Se lo quiero garantizar porque durante dos semanas estamos absolutamente dedicados a este tema de una manera intensiva. Y decirles solo unas breves palabras sobre Noah Cleaver. Yo llevo ahora ya cuatro días, eh, prácticamente todo el día con él. Es una experiencia sublime porque además a mí lo que más me ha impresionado no es solo su testimonio, sino que es, es un hombre que supo sobrevivir. No es fácil ser superviviente. El, el dolor físico, moral, el daño que crea ser superviviente es tremendo. Él rehizo su vida, además a través de un concepto que es muy loable en todos los aspectos y que se llama deporte. Es, un tipo, es una persona muy vinculada al deporte. Y en concreto ayer organizamos una cosa, cuando él me comentó que ha sido eh, directivo del Maccabi Tel Aviv y ha sido directivo de la FIBA, de la Federación Internacional de Baloncesto, es más, está en el Hall of Fame de FIBA, o sea, es una persona de gran prestigio en el mundo del baloncesto internacional, yo le ofrecí una cosa, digo, tú quieres conocer, si no le conoces todavía, a Juan Antonio Corbalán, que además nos honra hoy aquí con su presencia, y me dijo, sí, nada me haría más feliz que estar con Juan Corbalán. Y ayer desayunamos y juntos Juan Corbalán y él recordaron 
aquellos tiempos gloriosos de los enfrentamientos entre el Real Madrid y Maccabi Tel Aviv, que siguen siendo gloriosos porque siguen enfrentándose en las competiciones europeas, pero eso me demostró la calidad humana de Noah y cómo es una persona que ha sabido salir adelante y mirar la vida con optimismo y crear una gran trayectoria personal llena de satisfacciones, aparte de una familia, una esposa y una vida nueva en Israel, como él empezó. ¿no? Con lo cual, reitero mi, mi más sincero agradecimiento a Musealia, a la Fundación Canal, y la verdad, eh, yo creo que va a ser un privilegio el que puedan ustedes escuchar a Noah. No hay por qué repetirlo, lo hemos dicho ya muchas veces, pero escuchar el testimonio de un superviviente en directo es un privilegio que no durará mucho tiempo. Aprovechenlo. Yo creo que con actos como este cumplimos el mandato de no olvidar el mandato que nos marca la obligación con la Declaración Internacional del año 2000, de la que España fue parte y de la que, como españoles, estamos orgullosos de que sea un país activo en su cumplimiento. Por otro lado, es muy importante la actividad que se hace en los distintos ayuntamientos de Madrid con una gran participación de colegios locales de actos en memoria del holocausto. Quienes vivimos después de la Shoah, que es el vocablo hebreo con el que denominamos la tragedia, nos sabemos de algún modo sobrevivientes. Es obligación de todos transmitir el mensaje profundo del recuerdo de la arbitrariedad asesina del nazismo para intentar afianzar los valores primarios de la humanidad. Por otro lado, quisiéramos aquí públicamente agradecer a la Comunidad de Madrid y a su Gobierno por la positiva implementación de las líneas recogidas en la Ley Orgánica de Mejora de la Calidad Educativa referentes a la Shoah. Hay que ser realista y reconocer que la democracia no logró parar el ascenso del Partido Nacional Socialista en Alemania. En tan solo cuatro años pasó del 3% de los votos a alcanzar el 37% y constituirse en 1933 en el primer partido del Parlamento alemán. Es por ello que la educación en valores de las nuevas generaciones ayudará a minimizar las probabilidades de repetición de la tragedia y por ello rogamos encarecidamente a las instituciones y personas dedicadas a que prosigan y multipliquen sus esfuerzos. Para los judíos, la memoria es parte de nuestra identidad. En los 2000 años de diáspora fuera de Israel, solo la memoria, las palabras y nuestros libros constituyeron nuestra verdadera patria. La barbarie de la Shoah se produjo en la misma Europa que había concebido los derechos humanos, articulado la democracia y el Estado de Derecho para su protección. La voluntad de cumplir con el deber de memoria se hace más perentoria a medida que el transcurso del tiempo nos va dejando a los últimos supervivientes que nos están legando su testimonio veraz y conmovedor. Nos vamos a tener que convertir todos nosotros en testigos de, tes de los testigos. En este punto es decisivo el trabajo de Yad Vashem, Autoridad Nacional Israelí para la Memoria del Holocausto y, y Premio Príncipe de Asturias. Y también queremos resaltar el esfuerzo en este campo de don Miguel de Lucas y su equipo de Casa Sefarad. Hoy vamos a tener el testimonio de Noah Klieger, sobreviviente de Auschwitz y a quien damos las gracias por el gran esfuerzo de trasladarse a España desde Israel. Israel, país donde la mayor parte de los judíos sobrevivientes encontraron refugio. ¿Cómo es posible explicar la predisposición casi total manifestada por seres humanos a la hora de obedecer dictados de una ideología aterradora y llevar a cabo los asesinatos y gaseamientos de seis millones de seres humanos? La lucha de los judíos por encontrar un refugio seguro en algún lugar del planeta chocó con la indiferencia y el hermetismo de un mundo alienado. La excepción a esta regla 
fueron los miles de justos entre las naciones que arriesgaron sus vidas y sus carreras por empatía hacia el sufrimiento de los perseguidos. Nuestro diplomático en Hungría, don Ángel Sanz Briz, un justo, dando protección a judíos húngaros, permitió incrementar el número de supervivientes. Unimos nuestro recuerdo y dolor al del pueblo gitano, también perseguido y masacrado, al de los combatientes republicanos españoles, internados principalmente en Mazausen, al de los homosexuales y al de los discapacitados, así como al de los prisioneros políticos asesinados por pensar de forma distinta. Una empresa familiar española, Musealia, conjuntamente con la Comunidad de Madrid y en colaboración con el Museo de Auschwitz, ha tenido el gran acierto de traer a Madrid Arte Canal la exposición que aquí veréis, Auschwitz no hace mucho, no muy lejos. Llevan 80.000 visitas de alumnos de colegios y nos emociona saber que hay reservas para 120.000 más. En el Pentateuco se dice, mira, hoy he puesto ante ti la vida y el bien, y también la muerte y la adversidad. Deuteronomio, capítulo 30, versículo 15. Elegir la vida es nuestra responsabilidad judía y universal, pero son decisiones individuales que hemos de tomar como personas. Con educación, información, conocimiento y año tras año transmitiendo a las generaciones futuras, estaremos más cerca de que el nunca más sea cada vez más cierto. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. That small is what I know in Spanish. It's not true. <laughs> in over 60 years since I started to speak all over the world, and of course in Israel where I live, about the Holocaust, We call it Shiva in Hebrew, in Hebrew. I always said that one survived Auschwitz and the other camps only by luck. Not because one was stronger or more clever, no. What he needed was luck and a lot of luck. In fact, he needed miracles. I will try to tell you about a few of the miracles that occurred to me, and thanks to them, I have survived Auschwitz and a few camps that were, in fact, not worse than Auschwitz, but no gas chambers. The Germans had other methods to kill Jews than gas chambers. And they employed all the methods. I was in Auschwitz from January 18th, 1943, to January 17 to 18 in the night, 1945, on the day 24 months, two years. Unfortunately, not many of us did survive Auschwitz. But it was not over. In fact, it was a beginning because the Germans have evacuated us, like I said, in the night from the 17th to 18th November, 45, they evacuated <coughs> all the 45 subcamps of Auschwitz. Subcamps, there was Auschwitz I and Auschwitz II, 
in Auschwitz III, and then the others had their own names. Where the Jews, they, the guests, or literally worked to death. We have put on a march four days until we reached a little Polish town on the border with Germany, Gliwice. The Germans called it Leibitz, where we were herded into some wagons and transported somewhere. We were in these wagons for 10 days, open wagons in January. 150 people, men, in one wagon. I don't have to explain to anyone that there is no room for 150 men in one wagon. Although we were not very heavy, we were skeletons, but there is no room for 150 skeletons either. And the one who died, in the first hours already, could not even fall because there was no room. It took days until there was room, more and more died, and then we sat on their corpses. Finally, after 10 days, without any food, without any water, we arrived in a camp within the German Reich, a camp, it's called Dora Mittelbau. <clears throat> this was the camp where the Germans mounted and perfectioned their secret weapon, the weapon that for them should bring them victory, and I'm speaking now about April 1945, about January 1945. They wanted to win the war, a war that was lost for years already. After the Battle of Stalingrad, Germany was beaten, but they didn't want to admit it. When I arrived in Dora Mittelbau, the secret weapons, by the way, were the first flying bombs ever, called V1 and V2. When I arrived in Dora Mittelbau, I had lost my jacket. We called them the pyjama from this uniform we had, the striped uniform. So I only had my tattoo number on my forearm, but not anymore on the jacket. And I declared myself when they registered us on arrival as a French political prisoner. I was born in France and raised in France. And they didn't believe me. Why did I declare myself as a political prisoner? Because the Germans killed all the Jews, but not all the political prisoners. And I figured it would help me in this new camp which he did. Twice the Germans evacuated all the Jews from the camp and killed them in one of the sub-camps. And me, as I was not a Jew anymore, but I was a political prisoner, a Frenchman, I was saved. This was in first one of the miracles, the fact that I, that I declared myself as a French political prisoner. As this camp was much too small to absorb all the ones who came from other camps, they used, they had a, a movie theater. They evacuated the movie theater and we slept on the ground there really, really like uh, sardines, one on the other, in fact. And the one next to me 
who was there for some days already, told me that there's a secret plant where they put together the secret weapon. And there, the conditions were much better. You got much more to eat, although we did work 12 hours in shifts of two shifts. This plant was situated within a mountain, the Kornstein, a mountain of the hearts. It could not be attacked by the, by the Allied bombers because there was no bomb at that time who could penetrate the mountain. So they were safe. And I decided to try to be admitted to a commando, commando is a working unit, for this plant in the Kornstein mountain. And the next day, an assessment arrived, and he asked, who among you is a mechanic? And some 15 or 16 pointed, me as well. I'm not a mechanic at all. I have not the slightest idea about mechanics. But I figured if I declare myself, it's enough. It was not enough, by long not enough. We were ordered for the next morning in front of one of the blocks. Block is a living barrack. We were about 16 or 17. And one SS officer said to us, you told, you told you yesterday, told us that you are a mechanic, now you will show us what you know. And we were herded into a block. Where three people were sitting, two civilians and one SS officer. And we were seated, all of us, in front of little tables with a stopwatch either. And we were given, we, were, we had to undergo a psych. <coughs> a test, and I've never heard the word, I've never seen it, I didn't know what to do with it. And while I was sitting there thinking, what the hell am I going to do, a prisoner, a well-dressed prisoner, he was the one who distributed the formulas we had to, we had to we had to find it, where to find. He looked at my red triangle with the F for Frankreich, for France. He himself had a red triangle with an F. And when he passed by, he whispered to me, do you know something about it? And I said, no. He went on, he was with his back to the tree. And then he came back and he said, don't worry. I take you through it. And then he asked me the third time, where are you from? And I said, I come from Salzburg. And he said, so do I. And then, when he distributed, He gave me the one with the solutions, the one sheet where the solutions were. And he said, after two or three minutes, you stop the stopwatch and you raise your hand that you finished, which I did. 
the three, two engineers and one assess officer were very happy. What a fantastic mechanic they had among all these 16. Then they measured us from AI to AI. They had everything. And then we were brought into an atelier where we had to show what we can do. This Frenchman from Strasbourg, from my hometown, gave me the solution already. So I was the first as well. This was not only a miracle, it was an incredible miracle. I've, I stayed there for two months. I tried to find him, I never found him. Of course, I didn't know any name. I didn't know where to search for him. I could not, I wanted to thank him. I couldn't thank him because I didn't find him. But this miracle goes on. So, okay, I was admitted to one of the commandos for the Goldstein Mountain, a commando with over 600 prisoners. Over 600 had a head capo. Capo is a commander of a working unit. And he had, for the other, every hundred had another capo. So he was the boss of all the capos. And I said to myself, okay, now you go into the plant, but you don't know how to handle anything. They put, you in, they put you in front of a machine. You don't know how to handle this machine. You don't even know what this machine is. And I didn't know what to do. I couldn't do anything anyway. And we entered this mountain and we stood there and the Oberkapo said, I need a forearbeiter. A forearbeiter is in fact someone who tells the others what to do, how to work. Who among you speaks German? Five came one step forward, including me. I did already speak fluently German. And the first had the double triangle from the Jews, yellow and red. It's a, it is a Star of David. And he looked at him and he said, you speak German? And the, the, the fellow said, of course, yeah. And he, he was a very, very strong, heavy, tall fellow the capo, the over capo. <clears throat> he said, Jews don't speak German. And with his fist, he pulled him down and he said to the others, I don't want to see him anymore. And then the second one was from Czechoslovakia. He did speak German, but the Czechs did speak a different German than the Germans. And he said, your German is not German. He did the same with him. And then he came to me. And he looked at me and he said, where are you from? I said, I'm Frenchman. Frenchman, he said. You speak German? I said, yes, over a couple. Of course I do speak German. He said, how come? And I told him, I come from Strasbourg in Elsassy, and everybody knows that Elsassy is in fact a German province. It's not French. The French only have taken over. And he said, yes, that's true. Of course, Elsassy is German. It's of course it is not true. 
Elsa, she was always French, only once between 1870, the war of Napoleon against the Prussians, and 1914, World War I. Then it was occupied by the Germans, but it was always French. And he said, sure, everybody knows it's German. And then by his accent, I realized he was from Bavaria. The Bavarians have a special accent. And I said to him, Oberkapo, my father studied in Germany. He studied in Munich. And he said, in Munich, in Bavaria? I said, yes. He made a doctorate in Bavaria, I said. He said, I come from Munich. And I say, you come from Munich? I wouldn't, I couldn't have told, uh, I couldn't have believed it. Of course I did believe it, because of his accent. He thought he was speaking German. He was speaking Bavarian. And then he said, okay, you'll be the forebiter. But how do you look? How could I have looked? 10 days in this train, 10 days without food. I had a 40 and some kilos. And then he said to his other couples, bring him to, to a shower, give him new clothes. And I became a forebiter. If this had not happened, he would have killed me on the spot. That's another miracle, like the first one. So thanks to two miracles, I did work there for about two months. I didn't do anything because I was the one who had soup to supervise the others who did work. Of course, they all, it was a sabotage from A to Z, because most of these flying bombs, especially the V2, we called it the big cigar, it exploded after it was fired already, because they did, of course. Why should they help the Germans to build a weapon to beat their countries? Because they were all, I was the only Jew, by the way, they were all engineers, mechanics from France, from Belgium, from Poland, from Belgium, yes, from all over. And they were forced to work for the Germans. Of course they didn't work for the Germans. They worked against the Germans. But the Germans realized that there was sabotage. And they were hung, one out of the other. Hundreds, they had no gas chamber but they killed them by hanging them. Two months, and on April 3rd, we came out of the mountain, and we started to cheer. Why cheer? Because the town, there's a little town there, Nordhausen, it was on fire. The Allied had bombed Nordhausen, and we were happy that something is happening to the Germans as well. Of course, they beat us all, but on the next day, April 4th, we were put on march. They evacuated the camp. And this was April 4th, one month before the Germans did surrender. But they didn't give up. They still wanted to win the war. So we were taken on a march, the third one, my third one, to the Hartz Mountain, 10 days without food and without water. When we, when we left, we were 4,000. When we arrived, we were 600. We did eat grass. We wanted to, do, to eat something and arrived on April 14th in Ravensbrück, a camp, the largest women camp. There were two small camp for men, worked for the German industry, heavy industry. Now you would not believe it. 
April 14, they put us to work. Ditches, barbed wires against the tanks of the Soviet army. The Soviet came down with hundreds of divisions. You're going to stop them with ditches and with barbed wires? They were stupid enough to believe it. And we had to work again. And the second day after the work, most of us died there. They didn't die on the march, but they died after this. They were beaten to death because they didn't work fast enough or good enough. On the second day, when we entered the camp, at the gate, there was a high-ranking SS officer who yelled, who amongst you speaks German? And I said, I do. And he said, you come with me. And I went with him. And he said, you help me now because I'm taking off and I want you to help me with my suitcases, packages, etc. And I give you some food. And he gave me some food and I sat down for the first time in over in close to two and a half years that I sat at the table and he gave me food. And while I was munching the food, he said to me, you might make it. I will not make it. Because when they catch me, they will hang me. I don't know whether they did catch him or not. But in any case, he helped me. He saved me from, from dying. This is another miracle. All this happened, and thanks to all these miracles, I did survive, one of the few. And when I had decided to speak, this was one of my decisions. Should you survive, and you won't survive, but should you survive by miracles, you will have to speak. You have to, not to explain, because one cannot explain the dead camps. There is no explanation. One cannot explain the behavior of the German people who followed a absolutely madman, Hitler. He was not even a German, he was an Austrian. I speak, like I said, for over 60 years, trying to tell people what happened in order maybe to convince some of them, to convince some of them only, that there can be not, not such a thing, a developed, country, a developed people like the Germans were, cannot organize, plan, and organize the destruction of another, of, a, of another people. There are mass murders today, without any doubt. Some years ago, without any doubt. But none of them is organized. The Germans did organize the destruction of the Jewish people. And I want, it's enough for me if in 500 people, three are convinced that I'm right because I am right. I know what I'm talking about. That I'm right, it's okay with me. This is my aim. And I do it like I said for over 60 years. I get not paid for it. I volunteered because for me it's a mission. And this mission, I try as long as I can. I'm 92 years old today, which means I don't have many years to expect, but as long as I will be able to do it, I will do it. Because this is the mission I have decided when I was in Auschwitz, that should you survive, you will have to tell. You have to speak to people, and I do so. 
Hopefully, I have succeeded in some cases. I know I don't have succeeded in all, the, in all cases, certainly not, because we know that hating Jews today is, a, is again, how should I say, in, like you call it today. It's in already. Why, I don't know. The Jews are not different. The Jews are the same as you are, the non-Jews, exactly the same. We have honest Jews and dishonest Jews. We have beautiful Jews and ugly Jews. We have normal Jews and murderers, like all other peoples have. We are not different. We have not done anything to the world in order to deserve to being hated, but we are hated. And I don't know why. I will never know why, by the way, because none is able to explain all these explanations, the so-called explanations, are either lies or inventions or certainly not true. That's the whole thing. So like I said, I didn't want to go into the details about exactly how it was organized, how the Germans organized these camps, but I wanted you to have an idea what we suffered, what we went through in order to survive. And like I said, not many did survive. Out of one million and two hundred thousand Jews who were killed in Auschwitz alone, less than fifty thousand made it. Why did they make it, by the way? Because they were evacuated in the summer already and in the in the summer of 1944 to other camps in Germany. This is why they made it to Auschwitz. If they would have stayed in Auschwitz and gone on the march, the first march, only 19,000 out of the 60,000 that were left have survived the march. We had, they wanted us to march very fast and we couldn't do it and uh, you didn't march fast enough, they shot you, and the corpses were left on the roads of Upper Silesia to be either burnt or buried by the Polish peasants around in order to avoid diseases, of course. 19,000, in fact, have survived Auschwitz till the end from 1,200,000? No percentage, no nothing. It was, I, people say it's impossible, it was possible. I'm a witness for it, it was possible. They did. Now I'm very, I'm, I'm often asked whether I think that the Germans could start a thing like this again. And I say, I don't know. If they have followed, volunteered, to follow a madman, because they voted for him, he did not take the power, he did not make a push, there was no revolution, no. He was elected. His party was elected 44%, almost a majority. And then he was elected, they gave him full powers. They voted him even into a dictator. They cannot claim that they were not, they didn't know, they didn't want to, it's not true. Of course not all the Germans, but the ones who did something to save maybe Jews are very few. So, when I'm asked about Germany today, I say, I don't know. It's a third and the fourth generation. If they can do it again, I hope not. But others can do it, and others do try to do it. But today, fortunately, the Jews do have a country, 
and a strong one, one of the leading countries in the world. It will never happen to us again. There will be no Shoah for the Jewish people. We have paid six millions for this lesson. Six millions is enough. In fact, this is all I wanted to tell you. Should you have questions, I'm ready to answer questions, of course. Thank you for listening. Lo primero, dar las gracias a, a Musealia y a la Comunidad de Madrid por hacer esta exposición y por traer aquí esta tarde al señor Krieger. Eh, mi pregunta es, ¿cómo era la vida cotidiana de los niños, los más indefensos, si se puede decir, en el campo de Auschwitz? Gracias. Unfortunately, my answer is a very short one. There were no children in Auschwitz. They were gas on arrival. Buenas tardes. No sé si, gracias. Muchísimas gracias por su testimonio. Eh, llevo años embarcada en un proyecto de investigación acerca de la música en los campos de concentración. Eh, ¿Usted recuerda música en Auschwitz? ¿Recuerda orquestas o grupos de música dentro del campo? Muchísimas gracias. There was an orchestra in Auschwitz. They played when you, when he left the camp to work and when he came back from work. Of course, there was an orchestra, that's true. There was even a women's orchestra in Birkenau because Auschwitz won. There were only men in Birkenau. It was subdivided in the, in, the, in other camps because it's too, too, too big. There were 250,000 prisoners there. There was another, another orchestra from women. It, was, it existed, of course. Sí, hola, buenas tardes. Eh, quería preguntarle si podía explicar brevemente cómo era su día a día en, en Auschwitz. Eh, es decir, a qué hora los levantaban, eh, la formación, qué, qué tenían que hacer exactamente, la, la, el regreso al barracón. Si me puede explicar. They woke us like six o'clock in the morning. We had to go to shower. Cold shower even when it was minus 15 or minus 20. Showers were cold, no soap. There was, of course, soap. But you couldn't dry yourself. And from the shower, you went back to the block where you stood in line in order to get the breakfast. The breakfast was in most of the Auschwitz uh, camps was a liter of black water, cold coffee, there was no coffee, of course, and a piece of bread, dark, wet bread, four or five bites, maybe, and a little piece of margarine, of synthetic margarine. This was the breakfast. In the evening, we had a soup, always the same soup, always the same. A horrible soup. And on Sundays, the day we did not work, we got a little sausage, a little piece of sausage. And I always say that even a chief rabbi could have eaten it without any problem because there was no meat in the sausage. I don't know what it's made from. And a little, and a little spoon of jam, synthetic jam. That's the food, the work, 11 hours. Beaten all the time because they demanded go faster, 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 faster. And if you couldn't go faster, they started to beat you. In most cases, you didn't get up anymore. 
And then diseases, of course. We are dysenteria, all of us, most of the time, from undernourishment or typhus. How can you survive with a, with a treatment like this? And you were not supposed to survive. You were supposed to survive for two or three months because after two or three months, you were not able to work anymore. And they didn't need you because they have transports coming every day from all over Europe with stronger, with healthier people. So they didn't need you anymore. It's either you died of yourself, of exhaustion, or disease, or they made a selection where they decided on the spot who goes immediately to the gas chamber and who can go on for a few more weeks. Buenas tardes. Nosotros el año pasado eh, estuvimos visitando Cracovia y Auschwitz y la sensación de frío, ya no de frío ambiental, sino del frío que se te mete en el interior, fue tremenda. ¿Cómo, se, cómo una persona que está recluida allí, en qué piensa para sobrevivir un día más? Solo para decir, hoy tengo que vivir. ¿En qué se apoya? The only thing we did think of was how to survive, that's true. Now about the cold. Temperatures in the Upper Silesia, the town is called Auschwitz, by the way, not Auschwitz. Auschwitz is the German name. Upper Silesia is one of the coldest regions in Europe, next to Siberia, by the way. Temperatures sometimes go down to minus 27. How we did survive minus 20 or minus 15? Only for clothes. Some had a shirt, some didn't have a shirt. With this pajama we had, it is in fact impossible. And I certainly know, some years ago I was standing in Auschwitz. It was minus 12. With two very good friends of mine. The one was chief rabbi of Israel, Rabbi Meir Lau, and his brother, who passed away in the meantime. And they asked me both, by the way, Rabbi Lau is a survivor, but not of Auschwitz, of Buchenwald. And he asked me, how is it possible that you survived in this court and we were dressed, all of us, with fur hoods, with fur hats, with everything. How did you not did die the first day? And I told him because I wanted to live. And sometimes the will to live is stronger than in fact everything else. Not in, any, not in all cases. Most cases it fails. Some cases you go through it. I am one of the, the lucky people who did go through all this, wanted to live and did live. Eh, hola, señor Kliger, es un placer tenerla aquí en España. Eh, yo he tenido la suerte de conocer a Shlomo Venezia, que fue un sondercomando de Auschwitz, con el que pude hablar y le hice la misma pregunta que le quiero hacer a usted. ¿Cómo, después de las pruebas y los testimonios que hay hoy en día eh, acerca de los campos de concentración y el exterminio de los judíos, todavía hay gente que niega el holocausto? Deniers of the Holocaust are, in fact, for me, poor idiots, because one cannot deny facts. They do deny facts. They don't deny anything else. Some of them say there was no Holocaust at all. So what was it? The six million Jews committed suicide? The thousands and thousands, tens of thousands Poles committed suicide. The gypsies, who they called Cynthia Norma, committed suicide. Of course there was a Holocaust. If they say no, this is because they're retarded. They're dumb. They're idiots. I remember another case. Years ago, the University of Nantes in France, France 
gave the title of doctor to Stuan, who wrote a thesis about the night, the night, the night, the Holocaust, and he got a doctorate for it. Of course, in the world, it was a, a storm against them, and they had to cancel his doctorate. But can you imagine? By the way, only it's not has nothing to do with politics. It's only uh, facts. Abu Mazen, the so-called boss of the so-called Palestinians, has made his doctor in an Egyptian university for denying the Holocaust. People that have no brain can say there was no Holocaust. Somebody who has a little brain cannot deny the Holocaust. Hola. Uh, um, eh, yo tenía una pregunta. Eh, creo que he leído que usted cubrió los, los juicios de Nuremberg después de la guerra. Quería saber qué sintió usted cuando estaba allí y vio a aquellos criminales, primero, negar lo evidente, no tener arrepentimiento y, y, y no sé, eh, todo aquello. Y, bueno, uh, y muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Thank you very much for being here. I was at all the other trials. The Auschwitz trial in Frankfurt. The Treblinka trials, two of them, in Düsseldorf. The Majdanek trial in Düsseldorf. I went to all the others. I went to Lyon for trial. I was all over. I even came some years ago to the second trial of the Maniuk, an Ukrainian who operated in Treblinka and in Sobibor, in two of the death camps. In Israel, after it's not important how, he was first come, he was sentenced to death, and then he was freed after some years for it's not important why. But then, some years after this, the Germans decided to have him back from the United States, where he went, he went back to the United States. He, had, he, was, he was transferred to Germany. And in the trial in Munich, he was sentenced to some years. And while, by the, as long, in the time of the appeal, he died. So, The, uh, how the, the question was, how did you feel when you were in those trials? And then okay, dying? how did I feel by watching the trials? I must confess that in most cases I was in fact amused. Why? They were all, they were not trials. They were fictions of trials. The judges were the same judges as the ones who operated under Hitler in Germany. They were the same. They had no new judges. Most of the lawyers were the same lawyers. It was a, a farce. It was not a trial. None of them was a trial. They were farces. Because the so-called criminals were sitting together with the witnesses in the same cafe in the intervals, and they threatened them. They threatened the witnesses. Many of them were not even Jewish, Russians and Poles. They threatened them. If you will say a word more, we'll kill you. And the judges who sat there as well didn't intervene. They didn't interfere. These were, these were, like I said, they were laughable, in fact. Should it not have been so, 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 how should I say? Should they not have been such big criminals? I would have laughed, but of course I did. Well, I did voice my opinion. I wrote a lot of articles about it, of course. But like I said, what I felt, I didn't feel that the Germans wanted to bring him to justice. They didn't even want to bring him to justice. After this, for 50 years, 50 years, Germany has not accused 
one SS. There were over one million SS. The Germans have accused 70 of them. Not tried, by the way. Most of them were acquitted, most of them, for 50 years. They started again some years ago, after the second Emanuk trial, against people who are 95 and 96 years old. Not even me, I would send them to prison now. At the age of 96 or 95, how can you go to prison? Now they're trying to do it with about a dozen. Germany has done nothing, in fact, nothing against the criminals. They try to forget about it. These are facts, not me. These are the facts, history. The history is not a very long one. It only goes back by, 50, by 40, 50 years. You can see it everywhere. Look it up today in Google. Look it up in internet. You'll see what happened with the so-called, with the criminals, with the so-called justice of Germany in the last 50 years. Uh, sí. Usted tuvo un encuentro con una figura muy siniestra, que es la del doctor Mengele. Eh, me gustaría saber si nos puede contar cómo fue ese encuentro y si lo considera un, uno de esos milagros más que ha comentado. Okay. Uh, the story with Mengele is too long to be explained now. It would take you for 15 minutes, and I wouldn't want to do it in 15 minutes. It's a unique case. The unique case is a very good friend, a close friend of mine, who unfortunately died some year, a year and a half ago, Professor Eli Wiesel, a Nobel Prize winner. He wrote in one of his books that I'm the only person who dared to speak to Mengele. By the way, I've spoken twice in his hometown, a little place in Bavaria. Twice, why? Because they invited me again. I was there for the first time. This family still lives there. He was born there. And his family still lives there. Grinspoke, it's called. He said, I'm the only person who dared to speak to him. I tried to convince him to let me live after selection. And I did convince him. He did let me live. But in I'm the only case and the one thing I would like to say is that at the trial, the Auschwitz trial in Frankfurt in 1962 or 63, I sat with the, uh, <coughs> the chief of the accusation, a young man called Kügler. And I said to Kügler, he was the first one to issue an uh, international order to arrest Mengele. Of course, they didn't know, but they arrested him. And I said to this Kugler, you see, if he is arrested, I would be a perfect witness for the defense because he has saved my life. And then Kugler said to me, Mr. Klieger, he said, you're probably a very good journalist, but you don't know anything about law because you are the best witness for the accusation, because you are the proof that this man had the power to save lives. But he did the contrary. He was a doctor. Doctor meant to save lives, not to send hundreds of thousands to the dead. So you would be the best witness for the accusation. <laughs> Es un placer estar el día de hoy aquí con ustedes, mucho gusto. Um, entiendo y puedo imaginar un poco la impotencia. Eh, sin embargo, existió algún momento en el cual durante el trayecto, entiendo que eran muchas personas, hubiera algún momento en el cual pudieran haber elaborado algún plan en contra de cómo era la seguridad, tal vez durante el trayecto o durante la noche, para poder elaborar tal vez algún plan para poder sobrevivir. There was no, how should I say, the opportunities were much too bad. 
And of course, I give you only one number, so you should understand. Of the Jews, only seven Jews managed to escape from Auschwitz and live. There were more, but they were caught and hanged, of course. Only seven escaped Auschwitz and lived. Some of them even lived in Israel. They all died already. So it was almost impossible. They didn't want us to, to, to escape. And they, they were very, very, how should I say, efficient. In this field, they were very efficient. They were efficient in all the fields against us. But I did try, I did think, I did think about it. There was no way. I was much too weak. I don't, I, it's impossible, it was impossible for us. Like I said, only seven have managed to do so. Buenas tardes. Eh, usted ha dicho que no encuentra motivo o una explicación al odio hacia los judíos. No sé si tiene usted alguna opinión y me gustaría saber, como, como joven, por qué ese resurgimiento de la extrema derecha en Europa, y igual que, en, que, se, que votó el cuarenta y pico por ciento en Alemania a Hitler o al partido nazi, ¿Por qué en algunos países de Europa está teniendo tantos votos la extrema derecha? O sí, la extrema derecha. Muchas gracias. Well, it must be because the world has changed. Because, of course, it's not easy to understand why a party with people that are absolutely against the Jews and against others, not only the Jews, xenophobes. I don't understand it, but it happens. Probably because we are modern. And when you're modern, you do many things that you wouldn't do when you were not modern. It happens not only in Germany, but it happens the leader of the Labour Party in Britain. The leader of the Labour Party in Britain is an outspoken anti-Semite. And he was elected chairman of the Labour Party. So there must be something wrong. What is wrong, I don't know. Why they do it, I don't know. Like I said, you cannot blame us on anything. In the contrary, let me only tell you, I do it sometimes. We have given the world what still exists, the basis of law and the basis of ethics, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments say not only you shall not kill or shall not steal, it also said you should honor thy father and thy mother, and you should not be jealous of your neighbor, and you should not commit adultery. This all is in the Ten Commandments. And what's more, we are the first to have decided by law that there must be one freedom.